time to dig into my archives to say thank you. On March 27, 2011, BBC stops using 648 kHz for English language broadcasts to Europe. Although you'll still hear them via the internet, the medium wave button will be silent in my car. In the summer of 2003, I took a trip to the Suffolk coastal village of Orford, which has been there for quite a while already. I'd agreed to meet up with Andy Matheson, one of the few engineers I know, who takes a boat to work over the River Orr. followed by the short Land Rover ride out to the transmitting station on the marshes. Well, it's all stuff from the, uh, the Cold War era, yeah, 50s, yeah. It's also the birthplace of radar. Yes, that's right. Area here. And further down with Bordsea, isn't it? Yes, but you moved from here to Bordsea. Oh, was I see. originally here. There's an old Thames barge there, Thames barge. Yeah, the six on the right hand side here right. on 1296 were put up in 1978. Right. The single monopole was put up in 1983 and the five across the back, which is the main driven element on six or eight or driven array, they were put up in 1981, 82. The building itself is steeped in history, having been used for the highly secret experiments with over the horizon radar in the early 1970s. It was designed to be functional, wasn't it? <laughs> it? It was indeed. There's no, no play, uh, sort of design feature, major features. It's up on stilts because this, the floor level of the building is the 1953 flood level. Ah, there's a Dutch connection there. Yes, indeed, yes. The Foreign Office and later the BBC, were quick to spot that this is an ideal place to beam a strong signal into Europe. I've been uh, since my late teens, um, and uh, I was, uh, my first tour overseas was to Perim Island, where we had a medium wave station, and I've then uh, been mainly based at Crowborough with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, dip DWS, Diplomatic Wireless Service, and then went to Mazira Island uh, for a, a couple of trips, and also to uh, uh, Cyprus, to Ziggy in Cyprus. was in Cyprus when the uh, uh, Ladies Mile extension was installed, and saw the uh, Foreign Office Deity transmitters, which were built at Crowborough, uh, go into uh, Ladies Mile. After my first tour in Cyprus, I was uh, spent another year at Crowborough on the Aspidestra transmitter and then was posted up to Orford Ness in 1981 and spent three years here at Orford Ness and then again out to Cyprus for a four-year tour. During that time the BBC took over the Foreign Office commitment for broadcast and I joined the BBC, returned to the UK and eventually ended at the Wooferton transmitting site in Shropshire. Um, and from there I've moved into back to Orford Ness and uh, now I've been at Orford Ness since 1997. So transmitters are in your blood? They are indeed, yes. Well, what's the fascination with this type of work? I find them very satisfying. I, I enjoy either day work or shift work. Uh, just really working with transmitters has always been very satisfying. It good part of the industry I, I very much enjoy. A lot of teamwork involved because it's something... Very much yeah. so, yes. Um, I think with shift work you're working with a team, um, sometimes a varying team, uh, and here at Orford Ness we, we have a small team and if we come out on call out then there's just two, a, a one engineer and a ferryman as the initial team that comes out. So it's uh, very much a team, team job. Now, are these type of transmitters, uh, very high power transmitters, are they reliable? Generally, uh, they are, yes. Um, 
and uh, the more recent ones are quite complicated. And uh, a few years ago, there was always a large number of shift staff on, uh, particularly with the Aspidestria transmitters, there was uh, quite a large shift complement. But uh, when the move was made to Orford Ness with the installation, firstly of the FCO Doherty transmitters, they went on a remote controlled basis and then the AG Telefunken transmitter that was installed in 1982, that uh, um, was then remotely controlled from, from Crowborough at that time. So yes, we've moved to a, an unstaffed situation. I know perhaps over the Easter period, there would be a five day break and nobody would come to site during that time. Why did they close Crowborough? I think uh, the main thing against Crowborough was the site, in, it was inland and medium wave inland is not good and it's going to lose a lot of the signal going from the Crowborough area through to the coast. Short wave use of Crowborough was obviously not a problem in that respect. Um, they were looking for a new, new site and I understand Pevensey on the south coast was one of the areas they looked at and then the site at Orford Ness came available um, because of its previous use for over the rise and radar had ceased uh, rather ab abruptly in 1973 and so uh, the uh, opportunity was taken to move a, a, a 50 kilowatt transmitter that was not being used at Crowborough um, had previously been used in Betuana land for uh, transmissions into southern Rhodesia uh, it was um, uh, moved to Orford Ness and the signal out from Orford Ness was found to be so good into Europe that that really was the, the beginning of the end of the Crowborough site. Okay, perhaps you can explain that about the, the antennas behind us. The, there are five towers that I can count, plus one thing in the, in the, in the middle. Uh, what are they for? What are they, how do they work? Right, well, they're for the, that is the 648 service from Orford Ness, and the five towers is the main array. Each tower is fed by a portion of the output of the 500 kilowatt transmitter. There's two um, 50 ohm, four and one eighth uh, copper metal coaxes go out from the the building into ATH3 which is the middle tower, tower 3. There there's a power division network that uh, uh, divides the power and it's then fed in on power and phase relationship to the the five towers. This then gives a broad beam forward uh, direction to Europe on 132 degrees. So that's our main 648 array very good front to, front to back ratio. It's a, an antenna system designed by the BBC, was in fact designed for six towers, but Marconi won the contract to install the system because they proved that they could get the desired uh, polar diagram with just five towers. So we've got a five tower system. So you only beam east, do you? Yes, indeed, yes, just straight across into Europe. So you've got excellent reception in Amsterdam and lousy reception in Albra. Um, not so much Albra, but because uh, it's so close in, um, but uh, certainly not so far behind the antenna system, you, you do run into a, a mushy area, um, whereas in Holland, Amsterdam, yes, certainly a very good signal. Okay, so that's the uh, 648, and then in front of it, uh, there's a, a single tower. What's that? Y yes, indeed. That, that's a small uh, omnidirectional antenna. That was installed as a reserve antenna. Um, because we operate a 24-hour service on 648, we needed to have some um, reserve antenna facility. Uh, the local population were not too keen on many more towers going up, so a short antenna with a cap capacity hat on it has been installed. It uh, was installed at the same time as the five element array, and that uh, is adjusted the feed uh, and the capacity hats adjusted so that there is no tuning components at the base of the antenna. The 50 ohm coax just goes straight out to the antenna. It's fed up to the top of the antenna and then the actual 
mast itself is, is grounded at the base. And uh, that provides their reserve facility, but at a maximum power of 250 kilowatts. Yeah, so it's very much a backup. Rather yes, than indeed. Yeah. yeah, so if we're doing mast painting or we've got to do ATH maintenance or repairs, then that comes into service. Now, you're pretty exposed here on the coast. I mean, uh, is one of the problems salt? No, surprisingly not. We're very lucky in that respect. Having worked on some of the overseas site where salt, sites where salt is a, a major problem, um, no, we don't suffer any great problem from that. And our vehicles, I think, uh, reflect that fact that they don't rot away any quicker than uh, vehicles 20, 30 miles inland. So we're very lucky in that respect. But how often do you have to paint the towers? They're every seven years. And um, this year is in is when we're planning to paint the towers within a few weeks' time. It used to be that they were actually lit up at night. They were indeed. Uh, because we had uh, RAF bent waters and we were on the flight path, these towers were lit, but that air base was closed and uh, the need for the tower lighting was uh, removed. So at night it's just pitch black? It's just no lights on any of their towers now. But you do more than 648? Yes indeed, 1296 is our, our second uh, frequency from Orford Ness and we have uh, a six tower array. It's two three element arrays. Each half of the array is fed by a, a, a 250 kilowatt transmitter that coax comes back to the um, transmitter building. The center element of each array is fed and it's on a beam of 96 degrees. The antenna was installed in 1978 and the target area at the time was for skyway propagation down into southern Europe. Okay. Um, and this antenna replaced a, a six element uh, Yagi, vertical Yagi antenna at Crobra when the service was moved to Orford Ness. The problem with the um, antenna at Crowborough was the very low feed-in impedance on the driven tower and the feed impedance on the driven tower of the the 1296 array here at Orford Ness is further improved by feeding uh, a cage and feeding up and over the top so it's like half a folded dipole and then there's a an ATH at the base of each tower where there's uh, tuning components. I'm amazed about the fact that uh, you've, you've got this giant building. The, the transmitters are basically dwarfed by the building, aren't they? They are indeed, and uh, even the more modern transmitter, like a new uh, DRM transmitter, would fit into quite a small porter cabin or, or some form of cabin. It's purely because the building was here, um, its former use was, was had finished, and uh, we it became a very good site from a broadcast point of view. Just to check one thing, the Aspidistra transmitter, that, that uh, original one, that never moved from Crowborough, did it? No, it didn't. It didn't. There's, um, There's some components that came here. Some components came to Orford Ness, yeah. uh, fortunately, because as far as I know, that's all that's left of the transmitter. Um, it was scrapped when it came out of service. I went down for the close down when uh, Harold Robin pressed the off key for the last time. It was then, after that, scrapped. Fortunately, um, the engineer in charge at the time organised to have uh, a coupling coil and some of the valves brought up to Orford Ness from Crowborough and they're now displayed in a foyer. I believe one of the units was offered to the Science Museum but uh, they didn't have the space or facilities to take that on, which is, is a shame. Very little of this technology is actually preserved, is it? It is indeed, that's right. Um, and I think we'll live to regret that as time goes on. Fortunately, the engineers at Orford Ness have documented a lot of the work that's been going on in the building over the decades. I have a lot of respect for the precision engineering knowledge needed to keep these high power transmitters working round the clock. When you're playing with many thousands of volts, safety becomes a way of life. As well as keeping photos of what they've built, the back office also contains photos of the building's former life 
as the Sacred Cobra Mist Project. This was a joint Anglo-American attempt to build a radar system that could see enemy aircraft up to 3,700 kilometers away, so well over the horizon. A fan-shaped antenna was built at the end of the 1960s, and the building, on stilts, had two floors. On the lower level were the transmitters putting out pulses of energy, and that was run by the British. The floor above contained the receiving centre, where the return signals were analysed by the US Air Force. As we know from many publications since, the $100 million system never worked. After several years of trying to figure out the interference problems, the Americans suddenly gave up, and on June 30th, 1973, the system was shut down. But if you type Orford Ness into Google Earth, you can still see the outline of the radio antennas. Many of the white antenna rods are now supporting runner beans in gardens in the Orford area. And some veterans of the project have been back to the building on the marshes to share some memorabilia. For my part, I've decided to do more investigations into the golden age of transmitter technology, capturing these fascinating stories before they fade away. Thanks for watching.